you know, you get emotionally attached to training a certain way, right? Like yeah. when you hear that, you hear the quote, like whatever got you here is not going to keep you here, right? Like there, there's eventually going to be a deficit of fallback because you kids can't take that work tolerance anymore. All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Curious Competitor podcast. Our guest today is Jim Ferris. Jim is a Philadelphia-based trainer uh, who trains uh, pro athletes, local teams, fitness enthusiasts, and a celebrity or two uh, when they're in town. Jim is most recognized for his time with the Philadelphia 76ers, uh, who actually shares the same ownership group uh, as when I was with the New Jersey Devils, as a fast fact, and has uh, trained local pro basketball players in the Philly area for quite some time. Jim's expertise, along with his dynamic and creative coaching style, keeps players, coaches, and clients returning year after year. And uh, Jim, I think I was most of, uh, we followed each other on social media. It's always a little nervous as we get to meet each other uh, for the first time uh, via webcam. Uh, but I, I appreciate you have a strong sense of accountability. You have a deep appreciation for uh, the fundamentals and you understand the value of systems. And uh, one of those being that you're always up early. I was starting my research. It was like, 7 15 a.m this morning and already posted uh your instagram story three hours prior uh so this desire to get up and get after it uh this ability to hold your athletes accountable uh you know i, I know you mentioned you were a rower uh, on social media like is this where's this come from and why is it important to you uh obviously you know rowing is, is obviously uh something that got my early morning drive kind of going back in high school and um the discipline of, you know, you're going to wake up and within 60 minutes, you're going to be on the river rowing, uh, whatever type of practice that you're having. So there's a, a preparation for it, right? Like you kind of, mm -hmm. the workout tomorrow is, is kind of scaring you into eating healthy, going to bed early. Cause you're like, if I'm not ready, like, I'm just going to get crushed. Right. Like, you know, rowing is about specific output. There's no lucky bounces with the ball or a puck. Uh, you eat, get a row faster than the other people or you lose. Right. Uh, so rowing was, was very important for me. And even when I, when I stopped rowing and I had a, I guess a, a period off at, you know, through college, I was just like, you know what, like I just don't operate the same. So I, in college, I just started to set my alarm and I would just go out and I would run. And then I would have breakfast at seven o'clock and I would walk into the cafeteria and the little lady behind the counter, like, knew, like, my three-egg omelet with this. Like, I didn't have to order it. It was just became this strategic thing. And I was, like, the only one that was, like, picking the 8 a.m. class. Like, I had every <laughs> every schedule I wanted uh, throughout college because I was just – and then I was done by 11 o'clock, you know? I could go back and I could play James Bond and, and Madden and mess around with, you know, everybody around the dorms the rest of the day. But I just became addicted to the – you know, wake up, go get it before anyone else is out there and just get done. Like get my, get my checklist done and, you know, take it from there. You know, I, I really like that where you're sharing uh, about the challenge of rowing. I have a lot of respect for certain sports that other, let's call them skill or team sports and not that rowing isn't a skill, but we would identify the nature of those sports as punishment. You know, I think of the 400 meter track and yeah. field runners and I think of the pain involved with training for that distance and what I've experienced in my 400 meter runs rowing while uh, beautiful. I understand the, the lactic threshold is tremendously high. And uh, this has been something where, you know, in my own training, there's, I'm writing this down now, there's novelty. I guess there's frequency, right? And then there would be urgency within training and uh, I think as an athlete, I've always tried to implement systems that force those three things to show their head. And, and that might be uh, week in, week out, you know, sort of testing. It uh, doesn't have to be, uh, you know, super uh, complex, but something that gives feedback as an athlete, are, am I growing or am I falling behind? Um, would you agree right. that this is something that you try to integrate into your training protocols when you're pr programming for certain athletes or for certain groups? Yeah. You know, like I said, the way we do things nowadays, like, you know, I'm, I'm a big user of gym aware, right? Like that's my daily writing is testing. 
And it's something I can plug in weekly. But like I said, it can be plugged in at the end of a warm up. Like there's a way to strategize these things to see if people are uh, where we hope they are that day, right? Like yeah. it's, you just don't know when people are walking in the door. It's like, hey, you know, how'd you sleep last night? Uh, what'd you do? And you come in and it's like, you get on and you're usually hitting this number at 0.8 meters per second, but then you come in and you're hitting 0.6 today. And it's like, you know, what's up? Um, so w- whenever we have numbers uh, that we can have a discussion, it kind of ends debates. It, it, it kind of limits arguments because we have facts and it's like, look, like we have numbers, like for 10 straight days, you were hitting this, but for the next three, you hit this, you know? So like, what's going on? Like, how can I help? Or, you know, what do we need to have a discussion about to potentially change, uh, to give you a better opportunity to go perform. Right. So whether it's a test or just a, a daily readiness type thing, uh, it's all about numbers and the numbers are, are, are making sure that that, client or athlete is staying on track but also that you know i'm doing the right job for you like i'm giving you the right dosage because maybe it's maybe it's me that has to change because you're not responding you know the same as x y and z or or bob and mike over there You're, you're you're not adapting the same way to this specific stress and that's where we take notes right and that's where we say okay this is how we adjust it for you and that's how we can differentiate programs um you know, that are still within the same scheme of things, but give people, you know, you know, a better dosage for better outcome. Yeah, it's something I've I've considered in my own training where for a bit there, I was kind of going off of more of a, a day-to-day program, a checking in with uh, how I felt. I was missing some of that improved um, behavior and, and adherence to what I would consider to be like optimal recovery protocols. Cause I, I didn't, I wasn't aware that the task was looming for me, right? There's a certain level of sharpness uh, right. that I, I wasn't ascribing to. Yeah. And then the numbers thing, like I, I was like, I feel good. Mostly that's a little subjective versus, you know, a vertical jump test. You kind of can't just jump higher when you've already jumped your highest or a grip strength. Like these are sort of a, right. a dumb nervous system training uh, tools like you can't just grip harder when you've gripped your hardest. And when your nervous system right. is, this is all at a subconscious level. Like this is beyond just working hard uh, or, or trying to take it to another level. And uh, I think I've used gym aware. There's other software, you know, similar the Tendo units and things like that. And I really like them from a uh, intensity and engagement standpoint. Like as athletes, we understand numbers. We understand points. We understand, you know, salaries. Like we always want them to be higher flatly. And uh, I, I really appreciated yeah. the weight rooms I've been in. We did a really good job with it. For example, in New Jersey, I came to train uh, before the season for a couple months there. My wife and I were having our first child uh, before the uh, COVID season or the return to play after you know the COVID season was ended the year prior. And there were like some prospects and things like that in town already. And I wanted to crush these guys. And all our numbers were up on the board. And uh, I love that level of yeah. that, that gamification was very important to me as an athlete. Yeah. And that's, that, that's, it's funny. Cause I actually did a uh, training camp with the devils last year and I was a gym aware guy. So where's the fine line, Jim? Like we've got, we've got gym aware, we've got aura rings, we've got whoops, we've got heart rate monitors. And then I'll check Omega fjords, wave, Omega wave uh, which I, I did. And, and that was really a, a, an interesting year uh, of my career, but and then I'll, I'll check your feed and I see kids, particularly the high school kids, and maybe it's just a, a difference of who you're training, doing bear crawls backwards up an incline hill uh, and kind of focus on what I, what I might consider some old school work capacity. Uh, we're we're going to go through something difficult and you're going to sort it out on your own uh, type work. So, so what's the blend there? Like where is the old school intensity right and, and where is it wrong? Kind of right. like just wake up and get after it every day mindset. And the new school, you know, let's polish the statue. Let's not get hurt. Uh, let's just make sure we're growing our athletes. Uh, mobility is more important than anything. The, you know, the FRM, what are they called? FRS, you know, screening, things like that. Where, where's your philosophy mm-hmm. sit with all that going on? You know, wh- what time of year is it? How much time do I have? Like, am, am I the dominant person right now? Is this early off season? Um, mm. Obviously, as we approach the season, um, you know, d- depending on what, you know, the coaching wants and 
in terms of time management and stuff like that. It's, you know, how, how do I interject my role at that point? And I think one of the big things we do, it, it's, it's we have to observe the cumulative stress that athletes have, right? Like, uh, like you know how it is, like a 38-year-old hockey player, they're not the same as the 22-year-old, right? Yeah. So, you know, how are we going to, ma- how are we going to manage these people uh, from a dosage standpoint and um, look data and also understand like, you know, just this might just be how they tick and talk, right? Um, you have to be able to monitor stuff over time and maybe see if there is a trend involved, right? Like for me to come in here on day one and do whatever and tomorrow look at numbers and and automatically change things on people. I I just don't think that's the way you do it. Right. Like you have to give things time and just see how, how the trends kind of play out for people and compare it to their, their, their playing time, their um, efficiency in, in the sport. Like, are they performing at a high level? Right. Because it's going to be different for everybody. Like some stuff it's like, you're like, it just doesn't make sense. You know, like this person, uh, barely trains, doesn't do much practice, and then they can just perform at a very high level when it matters. And then you have the perfect practice player that does everything right, right? Like eats, sleeps, does anything, but doesn't perform. And this is what it comes down to, right? It's about performance. And it's about what they can do on game day. And I think having an understanding of that is very individual, individualistic towards the athlete. And being able to have a relationship with them, you know, and be able to just talk about things and maybe slowly interject things as time go on. Um, But it's not saying we have to flip a script on anybody on day one, but it's like, look, like you just got to learn it. You got to learn who the athlete is. Like you have to learn where they came from, learn their history. Um, Because, you know, when you're, when you're working in the pros, you know, you, you got somebody that's probably been with like anywhere from two to three professional teams already. They're coming from a, a pretty respectable division one program that probably had great training and you know, they have it, they have a history just like the same way they have an injury history. They have a training history and you have to just kind of learn, learn what works for them, what doesn't and be patient with what you can interject for that person. So, so this is actually one of the questions I had down. So as a, you know, strength and conditioning coach, as a performance consultant, Let's say we have that athlete who's maybe more of a practice player, and, and we can speak, you know, particularly to the audience if there if there are players out there who I, who identify as that, or maybe you're a, a parent and this is your son or daughter. I, I wrote down like for the athlete who preps their meals, they're getting seven to nine hours. They train hard. They check the boxes uh, from a, a training room standpoint. Uh, how much of a responsibility do you feel? to step in and start to guide that particular player towards, hey, I, I really think a sports psychologist would do you well. I think this is a, a mindset-wise, you're struggling to achieve a point of consistent confidence. Or, you know, hey, I love your presence in the weight room. I want you to keep coming back. You're always welcome here. Uh, I think you're definitely not getting worse by doing all of these right things that, that you are. I think a little different approach on the the skill side or the sports sense side. Have you looked into a consultant there? Because I is this something that you will get into, or is this not your job? How, what how do you view that? A hundred percent, a hundred percent, my job. Because I'm supposed to help you identify your weak links, if, if that's what we want to call it. And you know how do we how do we bring your weakest links up to raise your standard of play? And if you're already dominating the weight room and I don't have to coach you, like I can hand you the program, you're going to nail it. Well, you know, it's like, I have to find ways that I can help you with what's new or what's lacking from your, from your game or your performance. So yeah, hundred percent. Like it's not, I I can't force things on you, but I'm going to have the conversation or I'm going to figure out how we can discuss these things for sure. I appreciate that perspective because there, there, there's two players that come to mind. You, you, we, as players, we all take a lot of pride and we want to be right, right? Who we choose to trust with our off seasons. Uh, there's always a big, you know, financial investment. It's kind of, it's a, it's an aspect of control in the pro sport environment. You can't always control who drafts you. You can't always control whether you're on the power play or not, but how you prepare for the season, you know, guys take it very personally. And uh, there was a, a really high-profile trainer. The guy's trained tons of NHLers, and I'm sure he does a phenomenal job. 
Uh, but this particular player was a Stanley Cup champ, and I was talking to him. He, he was a horse. Like this guy would intimidate anybody walking into a locker room. He was he was built like a stallion. And I just asked him, I'm like, you know, how did you feel when you trained with this particular guy that I know you did? And he's like, you know, really good at you know getting you big and fast. Uh, but you know, I I frankly told him I felt like I was getting too big and too fast that I couldn't stick candle on the left side of my body anymore. And uh, you know, the guy frankly yeah. said, like, not my problem. You know, I'm, I'm here to get you big and strong. At some point, I got to turn it over to you. And, and that rubbed me the wrong way. I don't think there was enough nuance. Uh, and, I, and I don't think there was an ego drop that needed to happen to, to come to a solution on behalf of the athlete. And then I was, you know, secondhand, handedly very frustrated <laughs> for my friend. Yeah, it, it, it's a tough thing because, you know, we the people that want to just live in that weight room environment and take credit for the three months of, of just strength numbers increasing, but not seeing how it transfers to play. I just think it's a, it's a, it's a big problem that we have because like I said, there, there's the cumulative factor of, you know, 168 hours in a week and the carryover of what we're doing into your sport and making sure we're doing all we can to make sure the stuff that we do does help that. Right. Um, you know, at some point, are you strong enough? You know, it's always going to be debatable. Mm-hmm. But like I said, we need to see you play. Um, and that's like, if you're strong enough, are you fast enough? And then if you're fast enough, you know, are you strong enough? But like, it's, you know, are we are we spending two, three hours a day in the weight room when maybe we, we need 50 minutes? And then you can go spend that time on the ice and work on those skills. So, you know, like I said, it's always going to be different for everybody. Uh, but the discussion I have with with people when they come in the door, it's like, I'll look at you and I'll say, how many more contracts do you want? Right. And are you willing to do the work to make that happen? Uh, and that's, you know, working with me, working with your skills coach, uh, taking charge of the situation. Right. Because if I don't have a relationship with your skills coach, you know, we have a lack of communication. We don't know what's going on. Like you become, you could be coming to me on a Wednesday and I got like, you know, some low intensity strategy planned, right? But then you go to the ice and you're doing some high intensity strategy and then you're coming to me the next day and I'm like, well, we were supposed to do high intensity type stuff today, but you got cooked last night. So, you know, I, this is where we, we talk about accountability. It's like, I need to help you become accountable for yourself and take charge. But no, that, that's been one of the challenges for me over the years, you know, is with agents and with players. It's like, look, like, I understand what you want to hire me for. But the only way I can do it is if I can work with your whole team. Like, I want to be able to talk to your skills coach. I need to be able to talk to your agent and have an understanding of the, the overall what we're trying to achieve for you. Because, like I said, it's, you can't have 10 different schedules that, that don't blend together for, for the betterment of this, this athlete. Because it's like you're going here at, at, at 8 a.m., then you're going here at noon, but you're doing this at 6 p.m. at night. It's like, you know, how can we manage this better? And that's the part of the accountability, the discipline that I try to instill in these players because you're responsible. Like you're the one that has to go chase that next contract and hopefully get it right. Like it's not going to be based off of what I can do with you in a squat rack. Um, yeah. it, it's all part of the process. Yeah. I've, I've, you know, if you take athletes and you treat them like, you know, high end racehorses, right. And I, I've thought a lot of the behavior and uh, or, like like racehorses who also have to perform like golfers or like military snipers in terms of like their proprioception and ability to, you know, be one with, you know, sort of their, their tool and, and be able to be accurate and precise and make reads at, in high pressure situations. Like I, I am always surprised at the sloppiness involved at the higher end level of sport uh, or frankly, like the the passing on of high-end assets uh, and not looking after them with some sort of plan. You know, like I, I remember I was a player on a team and I was a, I was a healthy scratch and I knew what I was making salary wise. And there were a couple other healthy scratches and I'm looking around. I'm like, there's the salary caps, 80 million bucks or whatever it is. I'm like, there's $10 million on the ice right now. And like, there is nothing remotely close to, for what's going on, nothing looks like skill development. Nothing looks like appropriate uh, pattern recognition at the speed of a game. I'm like, 
this is busy work. This is noise. This is every single player on this team is getting worse. And I'm thinking to myself, if I, let's say I had $80 million and I was a, you know, I, I gave it to a financial advisor and he couldn't account for a plan for $10 million of that, I would have a problem. Yeah. A huge problem. And uh, I, I, I yeah. really appreciate, you know, where you're coming at it from a communication and an integration standpoint, because I, I do see this a lot, especially uh, in hockey as guys go to, you know, even within their skills repertoire, they go to different coaches and things like that. And it really is just sort of a, a, a hodgepodge system, you know, as it, as it functions. And so what do you do? Let's go through, you know, some of the stress management and identification you know, strategies. So let's say you have an athlete uh, who's on the higher end in terms of, you know, training IQ and they're, they're doing a good job and they are progressing. Let's say it's week four and and week five of the summer uh, of working with you. And then all of a sudden you're noticing a drop off that you didn't account for. What's the conversation look like at that point? So, you know, if, if I have my numbers, right, we can, we can discuss those first. And then the discussion becomes, what are you doing skill wise? Uh, what are you doing? Like, you know, you pick up play stuff like that. Like what's involved and what else is there? Like, you know, maybe you are a new parent and you have kids and you're, you're up at night now. So like you're, you know, you, you decide you still want to come to me at 7am to keep your, your, your traditional summertime slot, but you're not sleeping. And now you're up with a baby at night. So it's, I think just helping identify what these outside things could be interfering with it and you know a lot of times with me it's when i you know, working with a pro it, it's summertime right it's you know it's guys are young they're in their 20s uh they're gonna go you know they're gonna hit the beach on the weekend uh they're gonna go family trips so as much as like we want to have like a, a a great like rigid uh training program throughout the summer this is like the time that people also get to kick back and it's like, you have to help them figure out how they can manage some of that stuff sometimes. Because it's like, man, it's like, you know, you're on the road for 82 games or you're gone for six, seven months, eight months, and you don't get to see anybody. Now it's like, you know what, like I'm going to train and I'm going to catch up with these people and all that. So I think that's part of it is, uh, is, is lifestyle management is part of the whole picture and just helping them understand like the, the benefits of sleep and consistency with diet and the, the things that happen over the summer, because, you know, I think it's like when athletes are the most free. What are some of the systems you've been able to integrate with your athletes successfully? And and I'll share, I shared a couple when we were offline, but, you know, there's three that come to mind for me that uh, have, have really helped with, I, I am someone that uh, can listen to a particular podcast and all of a sudden I'm sure that you know the key to my athletic success is I just never need to eat again. I just need to fast and and go off of some secret fuel of ketones or whatever and and uh I can yeah. get a little excitable that way and and so some of the basics that have really helped me maintain consistency one would be, you know, protein getting it up. It it tends to drive satiation. I'm full. Uh there's uh, a a decrease in in interest in cravings or anything like that. Uh, don't skip breakfast. I think anytime I've done that, I'm very sensitive ca to caffeine and I love coffee. So like, that's just not going anywhere for me. Uh, but the cortisol yeah. can really get jacked up and, and lead to a, a pretty severe afternoon crash. And then if I can't sleep, do something that looks like a nap, just get lateral, uh, you know, stop fighting gravity for 20 to 90 minutes if I can. Uh, and generally there's always a lull in my day at some point, you know, the, the morning, my son gets up at seven, for example, there's, you know, some hustle and bustle there, but from 12 to three, things get quiet, you know, and then from three on, it's time to, you know, make dinner and Charlie's up again. And, and, you know, the, the, the family dynamic is different, uh, but those have been my big three. What, uh, techniques have you been able to find, uh, with some of your athletes? Uh, obviously diets, one protein intake is one of the easiest things I can get, you know, athletes to work on hydration is number two and, uh, time management is three. Uh, I make a goal in the summer with a lot of these athletes is to get all your work done before noon. Uh, no two a days, no three a days, yeah. uh, learn how to shut down. 
Um, not saying that there's no benefit to two days and three days, but like, do you need two days, three days when you've been home for two weeks and you have, you know, 16 weeks till preseason? No. Um, you, you have to learn how to, like I said, uh, do things at the right time for the right reason. And uh, I've had a very, very high success rate uh, with athletes and I actually enjoy it because it's like, yeah, look, I'm done. Like my whole day's over. And uh, I, I, what I really like about that is the, there is no particular uh, momentum pill that you can take. This kind of goes back to early mornings in college, right? Uh, you're, you're, you are responsible for getting off of that zero, uh, you know, get, getting away from that inertia and then creating some momentum for yourself. But I think it's a tall task with athletes. We have this, uh, you know, work, 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 train, train mindset. At some point, there is a, a great uh, sense of satisfaction from knowing you, you've completed the job. You're not working until infinity. And uh, you can step away and yeah. reset and come again tomorrow fresh, uh, aware of kind of what the time management might look like, and you can get after it again. And, uh, you know, I, I'm someone, yeah. you know, my, my program at one point looked like, I mean, gosh, you know, five, six days a week. This is just the off ice program. You know, I was in the gym certain days, the intensity between warm up and some of the, the higher end heart rate work or metabolic work or plyometric work would look like an hour, 45 to two. And then there were some slower days, you know, uh, a lot of overhead lunging, a lot of pulling, a lot of shoulder pressing. Those days could creep up into the three, three and a half hours. And I still hadn't skated yet. And uh, I enjoyed yeah. that program. I'd, I'd had some results, but I, I, you know, was trying to have a conversation with who I work with. Like, I'm a dad now, man. Like, this, I, I can't do this shit anymore. This is long. And it's not that I don't want to work hard. It's long. like, I don't want to be here literally one minute longer than the maximum amount of results I can grab. At that point, I need to leave. Right. It's tough. It's just, you know, it's a tough thing to follow because one, like I said, you, you get like, you know, you get emotionally attached to training a certain way, right? Like yeah. when you hear that, you hear the quote, like whatever got you here is not going to keep you here, right? Like there, there's eventually going to be a deficit of fallback because you just can't take that work tolerance anymore. It's, you know, you're not, <laughs> you're not that fresh. Your, your bones aren't that fresh, your joints, your ligaments, um, you're not invincible and you just, you have to learn how to manage all that stuff for the longevity of your career. Like, like I said, how long do you want to play for? That's what you have to learn how to do. You learn how to manage minutes. And I was like, I, the, the one example I love to give people because of time management and stuff is, you know, from working in basketball, you have Allen Iverson who I got to spend time with and he played, you know, every game and, played for years and then you have a guy that he competed against Stefan Marbury who played you know in the NBA for a long time but then he switched over to and their season's literally half it's like a 40 game like regular season and he played until he was like 43 years old well wow. because just because of, of slashing that season like right so you know but there's obviously certain things from a time management thing you don't control like you don't get to control how many games you play from a regular season standpoint or, you know, how long the season is, but you can control the off season, right? You can control certain workouts and things of that nature and just learn how to adapt a little bit, but it's tough because, um, a lot of times, you know, the, the pro ends up running a lot of the workouts in certain ways. Like they say, no, like I want, I want to do more. Like I want to, I want to work on this drill or I want to work on this, you know? And it's like, yeah, no one wants to say no to a pro right? Which is the hard part. Yeah. I had a, so. and, and some of these phrases just when you, when you hear them, they start to make sense. Like I had a, a sports science guy that I was working with and he said, I need you to stop focusing on getting better. And I need you to start practicing what being your best every day looks like. And that was, and that, that's, that's interesting. There's a, there's a, it's a different art there. And, uh, I'm in my 10th year. I, I think that quote can apply for a lot of players, particularly in season when they're in the meat of it, you know, in the off season when they have some, uh, some, yeah. some bigger concepts they want to wrestle with. Um, 
I think that's really helpful, the the AI Stefan Marbury perspective, because that is one of my questions. Like of the pro athletes you've worked with, what is the gift? So you've talked about how many contracts do you want to earn, you know, past this one you're on. What does an athlete look like who's handled this well? What do they look like at the end of their career versus what is the other trajectory? What does petering out look like? Like how does, what physiologically is going down when, when an athlete slows down? Cause we've all seen this, uh, you know, our, our hockey coach, uh, you know, when I was with the Leafs, for example, he was talking about an NHL great and it was really sad. He's like, you know, I need us to check this guy, you know, really be physical with him tonight. His legs are shot. His legs are gone. And I'm thinking to myself, like, what makes that happen? Of course, age, but there's other guys that, that don't age at a certain rate. And maybe some of that's genetic, but where, where can we play with this? Where's there room for wiggle? Um, I, I mean, I, I think that's part of, of, of play strategy, right? Like, you know, uh, you might be going up against somebody that's, you know, whatever you want to say, two steps faster than you, right? So, you know, your sport's a game of angles. Like you learn how to take angles away. You learn uh, as a defender, like, you, you know, you, you just have a, an IQ of what this person's going to do. And you, you, you beat them off a strategy uh, to some extent to offset some of the athleticism that you might not be able to to go against right mm -hmm. um and i think that's just a, I think that's a strategy that you learn how to how to play with like you learn how to play the cards that you're dealt and this is all you have you're like all right well this is how i can go in there for six to eight minutes and be effective because 18 to 20 minutes isn't in the cards for me uh at this at this point in time in my career or in this game against a specific team right so I, yeah. I think that's part of the, uh, of the challenge is, is knowing uh, the value of your skill set at a specific time in your career, right? Like, it, it's like, you know, are you still a starter? Or are you, are you going to be, or are you still first line? Or are you going to be more of a second, third line guy and, you know, be productive? So I think that's part of it. I think that's, uh, you know, it's part of maturing. I think that's part of a, an ego type thing and, it's part of the business. Like if you still want to play, it's like, okay, this is how you adapt to it. Yeah. I've spent a lot of time thinking about that. You know, even in my own career, we talked a little bit about how people tick, right. And this can look a, a couple of different ways. Like I've seen it in our training groups, guys that are they're kind of slow starters. They need to get their heart rate up. They need to get a sweat. They need, you know, lots of glute bands and lunges and, they kind of need their eyes to, to start to look around them, you know, 360 degrees, right? They need to start to know where they are in space. One of the things I've talked with, you know, the coach I've worked with the last few years is like, I need a punch. If I crawl and lunge and move around for 30 minutes, like I'm just bored or, or tired. I get like worn down. Yeah. I want to hop on like the leg press and feel some, some burn for, you know, uh, let's call it a, a 60 second about and like I get off that thing and I feel like Spider Man, like I'm ready to go. And uh, yeah. some of this comes into the, yeah. the time efficiency standpoint. Like, so what drives that? What what makes certain athletes uh, respond to different stimulus differently? And do you have examples uh, from your career that are are memorable and and kind of create these camps uh, for, for people who may not have that you know biomechanics or physio physiology background? Um. Yeah, like I said, you know, certain people are going to respond to different stressors differently, right? Like, you know, and I think that's, is it a condition all the time? Like, no, like some people just don't handle this type of stress well. And it could be specific, right? Like a 10 second bout, um, you know, sprinting can be very different than 10 seconds on an assault bike, yeah. right? Like the, the effects that it has on somebody uh, can be completely different. So, you know, I, I just think it's, understanding what your response is to certain stress and you know how you can improve that or offset it or learn how to manage it from a from a playing perspective that's why it's like you got you know some players are just better bench players because they come in for quick spurts right they, mm -hmm. they, they just that's what their engine is that's what their engine is like, like what would you recommend that athletes just kind of play with particularly their different warm-ups or have these conversations with their coaches to kind of find out what brings them into the fight 
Yeah, because, you know, there, there's a, obviously from a skill aspect, there's, there's certain things that you're going to look at, but from uh, whether it's an energy thing or an effort based, um, you know, how, how is it affecting you uh, from the performance side of things? Because it's just different, you know, like if we if we're doing something on a, a fixed thing, like I said, like an assault bike and just doing repeats, like that's just a different animal than getting out on the ice or getting out on the court and, you know, playing your sport at a high level. And whether it's like, you know, it's uh, people are using a lot of what, like GPS type stuff now and like tracking like mm -hmm. distance and heart rate, like while you're out there. And is there a way to use that type of data to help? you know, maybe like control things a little bit more. Um, whether it's like, you know, playing out a position or um, I don't know, just a, just a management from effort that, you know, are there things out there that they just don't need to be doing at certain times that they can conserve energy and just play better. Yeah, there was an interesting uh, play last year. Leon Dreisaitl is one of the NHL's best players, and he, he's tremendous. He plays with the Edmonton Oilers with uh, alongside Connor McDavid. And he had a, a really nasty ankle injury. And the joke was he looked like a, a bubble hockey player out there because he'd had you know two skates on the whole time, couldn't bend his knees, couldn't skate, and was still tremendously effective. And and I was listening to a podcast with him and, and Elliot Friedman, who's one of our you know media personalities in, in hockey, and he was discussing what he'd learned about the immobility and and where he thought he was wasting uh, his skating and and you know over the course of a season. And like basketball, we have an eighty two game schedule. Like, you know, what could you do with an extra twenty percent in the tank every night? And it, and it really is available when you start to really comb through uh, a your game, a player's game, the game as a whole. Like, what on a macro level, like what drives. Uh, success and and you know what is kind of fluff or noise out there and you know, this is something that I think uh, I want to draw off on your your background in basketball. Uh, what culturally is something that basketball has right from a training and performance standpoint, and what is something that like you just you shake your and maybe this is a second question, but you shake your head at like guys this, we are we are cutting ourselves off at the knee here uh, with this you know culturally. Um, so basketball, you know, we always talk about, we talk about conditioning. We talk about all of this stuff, right? How do you get more conditioned to play your sport? It's by playing your sport, right? Because of all the intangibles involved, of, you know, the, the moving and, and the skill acquisitions and, uh, completing whatever tasks you're trying to do. Um, basketball, there's courts endlessly everywhere. You can go play basketball every single day anytime you want you can get 10 guys um you know can you can you just walk into a rink and, and get pick up hockey with like a good group of guys i don't know i don't think it's as easy mm -hmm. um can you walk to a football field and uh find 21 other guys ready to put pads on and play football uh no so i think like i said it's a double-edged sword right like you can you can lose game seven of the nba championship uh tonight and some of those guys are going to be on the court tomorrow wow you know it's like is it, it's just where the, it's what they do they they live on that court and they just have access to it they can go play so that's like also it's other thing look like no not tomorrow like at least like let's let's figure something out um so that's the problem it's like you have access to it but it's almost too accessible um to just go too much time on that court Okay. I appreciate that. Yeah. It's interesting. It's something I've, I've always been jealous of, of the other sports, like be, because ice time is by the hour and ice time's expensive and it's, it's frozen. Yeah. It's hard to find. Like it's, it's time to get after it when you get out there and, you know, neurologically, you know, for the learning process, there's not a lot of time for differentiation. How am I doing this? What would better, easier and smoother look and feel like? Uh, and you yeah. miss this element of play that is so important for the dexterity you see in soccer, uh, for some of yeah. the, you know, high dexterity you see in, in basketball. We have the, you know, additional, you know, need to uh, manage gravity on, on skates and on a frozen surface. So there, there's all these other elements uh, unique to our sport. And, uh, 
you know, it's no secret. The best players are the ones that have had a little bit of this extra access to play. I think it's gone, unfortunately, a little too far. And maybe we could talk about this with uh, transferring a little bit more to, to youth development, how kids are specifying, and I, I'm using air quotes for those people that can't see me, uh, you know, for their sport very early in hockey, we've seen the emergence of like these development schools. Kids are leaving, you know, public and private schools and entering into these like work play programs. They're going to school for like, you know, four hours and then they practice at, in the afternoon. And then again, you know, at 5 p.m., let's say with their team. And that comes at a cost. Like hockey is pretty tough on the pelvis and on the shoulders and on the upper thoracic, you know, due to the hunched down nature. And, you know, I'm, I'm very interested to see the skill level. It's irrefutable. The next wave of player is extremely dynamic. Um, but, you know, it, it's to be told, we'll, we'll see what the injury rates start to look like, you know, as these, the, the hockey school, you know, sort of test tube player starts to, starts to play in the NHL. Yeah, it's uh, the youth side of things is is creating a lot of challenge. And I think in all sports, um, we're at a point where, you know, when you when you look at what I do uh, from a coaching side, there has to be a teaching side first, right? You can't have any, everything be high output, uh, high expectations, high numbers uh, before they even know what they're doing. So, you know, when you walk into a weight room, like the first thing, you, you know, you don't do is, is do barbell back squats, uh, for, for max. Right. But like we have kids that like don't even know how to squat or what we're trying to, to achieve with a squat. We have kids that, I mean, they can't, they can't do push ups. Like they just don't even understand how to, to keep body position correctly. And, you know, all the stuff that I do a lot of times gets thrown in as a penalty, uh, in sport, if, if, if something's not done, it's like, hey, everyone drop down, give me 50 push-ups. And I'm like looking around. I'm like, well, I know 70% of the kids can't do five. Yeah. But they're gonna do a they're gonna do a set of 50 and they get back up and practice. It's like, no. So it, it's like you're you, you know, you're trying to learn calculus, but you haven't learned basic math a, a lot of ways. Like we're trying to push things way too fast and I think the perception of what the weight room is supposed to be um, isn't always accurate, right? You, you don't always have to look like you're walking or crawling out of the gym, right? Like you could go in and do three sets of eight and walk out and no one would even know. But now it's like, you got to be crawling to the car. It's like, you got to be like, ah, oh, did you get the weight room today? It's like, yeah, it's like, you know, we went after this, we crushed it. Um, everything's about crush, and it's, 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 I think it's a, a very important time for us to just be able to teach these kids how to do things correctly and, you know, not worried about numbers, not worried about outcomes, uh, you know, to the kids ready for it, honestly, because like I said, it's, we're, we're creating this thing where it's like what an eight year old thinks that's the only way that you train. Well, what are they going to do when they're 16? The same thing. Right. They're, they just have this built into them. It's like this is the only way you get better is by destroying yourself. And a lot of these workouts with these with these youth kids, it's just like it's just bury them into the ground and you just don't see a lot of coaching. Right. Like, I mean, let's say come in, we're going to do a, an agility session. I'm going to put this ladder down and for 30 minutes, we're going to do like icky shuffle into this like hops over Bosu balls. And then it's going to, you know what I mean? It's like, we're just creating obstacle courses and, and things that sure there's, you can call rhythm coordination, uh, you know, some other stuff is involved, but like, are we actually helping coach these kids to get better? And I don't think we are. I think we're just doing stuff. And when you do stuff, uh, it's a very generalized thing, right? If you put, you put 20 kids out there and you just do this one thing over and over again and, when I talk about generalized norms, you have the top third, the middle third, and the bottom third, right? So the top third might get something out of it, right? They might just, yeah, because they're already better. The middle just kind of stay the same, and then the bottom third just get worse, right? These, like, they can't even, like, there, there's no coordination, there's no rhythm, and, like, how do you coach a kid to get better at the icky shuffle? You know, it's like, what what's that doing? So, you know, why aren't we teaching 
like body position, arm action, first steps, uh, deceleration, all this stuff. And these are the things that you identify and then use them in the weight room to help these kids get stronger, get better. Right. Cause that's what it's about. It's, it's getting, it's putting kids in position to get better. And that's what coaching is. And I just don't see enough of it. I just see stuff. I just see workouts and things and yeah. Well, what I think is really dangerous about that is we take an environment, the weight room, you know, yes, it's a time for challenge, but it, it's, it's really a, a place of investment. You can come here with your injuries, we'll turn you around and you'll, you'll feel more pain free. You'll be able to sleep better because your, your psoas or your shoulder and these things are going to calm down, whatever it is. Um, and it, it takes this place that can be very rehabilitative and, and medicinal and it creates this aversion at such a young age where my sport is my safe place because I'm actually good at it and everyone thinks I'm good and the coach keeps playing me and I get you know compliments and my family tells me I'm great. But the weight room over there, every time I walk in there, you know, the, the strength guy is all rah-rah and we need to, you know, uh, you know, be broken today. And and that's an area where I get hurt, and that's very backwards. Uh, it should yeah. be a place of, of welcome and a place to build and, and have a sense of investment in your game. And I think that, I mean, to zoom out, I'm pretty passionate about it. Like I, I, I appreciate some of the information you put out on social media and, and inviting what we identify as the gen pop population into being more accountable for, the health, for their health. Like we just don't have a culture that's really educated on what to do and how to do it and why it works from a wellness yeah. and weight room perspective. I was over in Prague for a wedding and, and I'll, I'll finish with this and turn it over, but like I, I went to a commercial gym and I couldn't believe the IQ level of the level of training that I was seeing. Like it was really high end compared to what you see in the United States. And it, it bummed me out. Yeah. Um, you know, we talk about it a lot. It's everything for me. It's an expression. It's your ability to express something, power, strength, uh, complex type stuff. So, you know, you're going to squat, right? But I don't know how, how you're going to squat yet, right? You might be going, you might be going Zerker squat. You might be going front squat. This person's going safety bar squat. Uh, this person's going heels elevated on a wedge kettlebell. Right. It's just like find a way that people can express the pattern in a safe and effective way. And then you figure out how to load them from there. Right. It's like find push patterns that work, find pulling patterns that work. Uh, you know, it's like how many times you see people deadlift and RDL, you're like, you feel that in your hamstrings? And you're like, nah, no. Nah. You're like, all right, cool, put more weight on. You know, it's like, are you like, are they feeling these things in the right spot? Are they positionally ready? to load a certain way and you know it's like everyone just walks in and back squats right it's like hey well that's what the record board says on the wall right like we got back squat to to break this whatever it's like well i get it maybe that guy can back squat but you know that's not where you are at this point it you know in your progressions and i think that's one of the big misses because it's our job is to put people in position for the potential of success, right? And if we're not putting, we're not setting people up for success, we're setting them up for failure. Yeah. And that that's that's athletes or general pop. So why would they want to come back when there's no way to win? Like literally no chance to win because we're just like, all right, you're going to get crushed under that bar. So go get it. And it's like, ah, oh, yeah, you got them mentally and they're mentally getting tougher. <laughs> I'm like, oh, they're going to have a lot more time to get mentally tougher because they're just going to be, you know, out. They're going to be hurt all the time. So I think that's a, I think that's a challenge and just to get the people understand. It's like, look like you can, you can have 10 different programs, you know, going on at one time with, with 15 different kids if you have to. It's just because that's where they are. And it's what's going to help set them up for their long-term athletic development. Right. Like it's this, this isn't the pros yet. Like, 12 year old, 14 year old, like it's like you're still early phase to me. Like, even though you might be a high end hockey player, you're still a 14 year old kid. Like, you still gotta, like, you know, learn to do a lot of different things first and uh, progress is necessary. 
Yeah. Yeah, I really like the frankness of this. I, I remember I was at the U.S. development team, and uh, we had a player on our team ask, like, hey, it's fucking boring. Can we have some music on in the weight room? And our strength coach was like, you know, you don't listen to fucking music while you play the game. And the player snapped back like, I don't have 315 on my back either when I play. So, like, what are we doing here? <laughs> <laughs> and and it it really invited to me like this conversation around like what are we doing like are, are we grinding to grind here are we in navy seal school where they're trying to see how long we tread wire like all we wanted was some music on i think most everybody can relate like there's been studies done if you've got music on you can your output's a little higher like can we agree on something and there was this weird prickliness between you know strength coach and player where i'm like do you inherently have this like us versus them mindset like do you really think we're soft like we're all here at the u.s development team like everyone here is a stud and yeah. uh it, it really was this like you know very frank moment that i think right, this is a little backwards and i have no i have no problem with you testing us or maybe saying today in particular we're implementing a new program I coach 20 of you guys. I, I need it down just so I don't have to scream. Uh, but this was, you know, the end of the year. Like, we were a machine. We knew what we were doing. We had our warm-ups on the board. Everyone had their program. Like, it was well-oiled at this point. Like, we could have done some low-level, you know, big booty mix or whatever, and we would have been fine. And yeah. uh, I don't know. I I, uh, I appreciate the freshness. I appreciate, you know, the professionalism uh, you, you bring for yourself and, and demand of your client. And uh, I, I, I really appreciate your voice of reason in a industry that there's a lot of clashing and banging and, and, and disagreement when the principles really aren't that difficult when applied safely over time. The results are pretty well known and well studied, um, you know, for what a, a healthy weight, weight room program looks like. Yeah. And I think the other thing, you know, I always tell people, no matter where you are or who you're with throughout the year, you're always just in a continuation of a program. And I think, you know, it's like, everyone's like, oh, you know, I'm leaving the team. I'm going to work with my guy. We're going to start our program. I'm like, no, like, how is that the answer? Like, it's, it's always got to be a continuation and it's got to be all parties involved, uh, whether you like it or not, because it's like, you know, you, when you're with the team for year round with everything that they have access to, there's a reason why they want you to train a certain way and do certain stuff. And then it's like, I think it's a lot of times like why players go hide. They're like, you know what, I'm going to go back and I'm going to work out with this person. We're going to just do my own thing. And then that, you know, you're gone for three or four months, five months. And you go back to your team. It's like, we've been doing, doesn't look like you've been doing what we were doing. You know, it's just like, and I think that's a big reason why, why some careers don't go the way they should is just because of, of easy things like communication and, and working as a professional, right? It's like, you're, you're not the one that's going to write the program, right? It's, it's everything should come under the guidance of the pros that you work with and be communicated amongst all parties. Cause that's the only way. I like that. And, and, you know, one, one sort of parting question before I let you go and Jim, I, I appreciate your time today would be, you know, you've been around pro athletes and pro sport for quite some time. I've only had the career I've had, uh, you know, it'll be my 10th year, I guess. I've said that a couple of times, but what is a particular stress on pro athletes that you've seen today that 20 years ago was not present? Uh, and, and what's the cost of it? Um, I, I think today what we're seeing are the, the injuries that we're seeing today aren't what happened 20 years ago like 20 years ago like you know roll an ankle uh you know little hamstring twinge but now you're dealing with people carrying around uh, you know two torn acls it's almost becoming like a common thing in sports um so i think injuries and, and the level of the injuries that we're seeing um and understanding you know what you have to be able to do to continue off of off of that injury like how can you come back and play effectively and it's not just go back to what you were doing before like there, there's definitely going to be load management that has to be understood well i um, i'm really glad I you put that, brought that up because like something 
as an athlete growing up that I th- you just think it because it's said all the time is like whatever doesn't kill you will make you stronger and I just want to like wave red flags that no if you're injured like you will be weaker this thing does not go away I had a pretty nasty you know ankle break years ago I, I took a puck off the ankle and had surgery and like it bothers me proprioception yeah. wise like you know those four toes are the right of my big toe it was my right leg they go a little numb it gets a little difficult to road load through that right you know uh back pocket through the glute it just it goes offline a little bit and that's yeah. something that they, they whoever they is like they don't tell you that and uh yeah. it's it's a, it's a real cost that needs to be discussed as you mentioned and communicated through yeah accepting your reality you know this is where you are and you know if you want to keep playing like you, you, you just got to learn how to accept certain things and adjust. Yeah. Humility, humility, writing that down, double circling it. I, uh, I talked with my father after he started training again and he was kind of a recreational athlete growing up and he'd, he'd mentioned, I said, how to go, you know? And he's like, I just can't believe that I can't do more. And I was like, dude, I'm a, I'm a pro. If I take two weeks off, like that first day, I'm looking for the exit. Like I'm in trouble, serious yeah. trouble. I'm like, you haven't trained in 30 years. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. And so if, I, I guess if we can encourage uh, an appreciation for the long game and a, and a sense of humility in anyone that's listening, uh, I think that would be a, a, a great use of our time. Yeah, for sure. Jim, I appreciate it. Uh, anything before I let you go that you'd want to ask me, particularly about uh, hockey, what we do? Um, not to put you on the spot, you can pass, but I, uh, I wanted to offer no. it up. No, man. Like I said, like, you know, I, I watch your stuff. I watch your posts and that's how I got very intrigued with what you do. And it's like, man, it's like actually great to see a guy that's living it, you know, the right way. It's like, this is what I want other athletes to be able to see. It's like, you know, wake up and piss excellence every single day. Like you're responsible for yourself. You're responsible for your career. Because when it's all gone, you know, everyone else disappears. The strength coach is gone. The PT is gone. Every, that whole support cast isn't with you anymore. Uh, but like I said, you know, just take accountability for everything that you're doing. And uh, like I said, just keep being that motivation for the, the next generation. Yeah, I will. I appreciate that, Jim. I appreciate your time and I appreciate that. So have a great rest of your day. Yeah. Um, get after it. All the best uh, to your afternoon team. Hopefully you take it easy yep. on them after getting fired up for the last hour. But <laughs> yep. have a uh, have a go, on, man. Good to meet you. Thanks, man. You too. Yeah, of course. See you.